Hi, my name is Jonathan Brill. I help organizations figure out how to plan for uncertainty. I'm the author of this fantastic book, Rogue Waves. And um, the best advice I have ever received or been given is to not use your poker face at the roulette table. That's awesome advice, Jonathan. So where did you learn that? Who, who, uh, you know, who taught you that? You know, it came, it, it came uh, over years. I, I had a fellow I worked with named Tip Simpliner. He was a inventor, um, mechanical engineer, cartoonist, industrial designer. He was, he was someone who had done so many things at a level of mastery across his life. And, and his point to me as I was growing up is that there are two ways to be successful in life, right? The first is that you go straight down one rabbit hole. You, you really just become an expert at finance or, or you're, you're an expert in, you know, some technology. And that does really well the first couple of years of your career, right? You, you, you're a specialist, you get well paid, but over time, the real benefit that we can bring to the world is that we know more things about more, uh, parts of the world than other people. And so when something changes, we're, we're in a new situation, we have more tools, we have more sensors to understand what's really going on so that we make sure that we're playing the right game instead of the game that we played before. Ah, that's good. So, so yeah, so if we make that practical and tactical, right, don't play poker at the roulette table, it's basically, right, no game, figure it out and then go ahead and move into the game is that right that that's absolutely right and it turns out that we because we become more specialized as a as a species and, and in our professions uh and and how we educate people right we we are getting better and better and better at the games we learn how to play without learning how to play more games you know and so when we deal with the more volatile world that we're in today the challenge is that we don't have the broad toolkit to understand the future, to understand the game that we will have to play next so that we're building our optionality and our potential as we move forward. Instead, we, you know, so much of the time we focus on being agile, we focus on being fast, we focus on inventing our way to success. The, these are really important skills in situations where that is the best strategy. Hmm. Mm. So but that's, that's not interesting. Always yeah. Huh. That's very interesting. So, so if that's, you know, th that's true, right? If that's true, then how do we, you know, how do we broaden that out, Jonathan? How do we even understand that there are more games? Because I think a lot of people think that the same game that I played yesterday is the same game that's going to be here tomorrow. How do we help people realize that? For sure. Well, in, in, in let me take a couple steps back. So, um, this is kind of our broccoli moment for the day. I'm sorry it's so early in the morning. Um, uh, but broccoli apparently does go well on toast. Um, in philosophy, there are uh, there's a field of philosophy called epistemology, which is how we know what we know. And remember, everything we do, whether it's the law, whether it's language, whether it's mathematics, right? science, it all has its foundation in philosophy, specifically in epistemology, how we know what we know. And there are four major ways that we know that we learn new things. One is um, deductive logic, right? This is what a lawyer does. And they, they'd say, here's the universe of facts based on this universe of facts. Here is what must be true. Scientist does something different. They say, hey, here's the set of information we have so far. Here's the most likely thing. Here's the most statistically probable thing. An economist looks at that same world and they say, I built a model of all of the stuff, how it goes together. And if we change the input here or we change this, this little node here, you know, here's how it will change the output. And then you talk to an English major, a science fiction writer. And they look at the world and they say, oh, wow, this is fascinating. We have this set of rules, right? Newtonian physics. What if gravity didn't exist? 
right? What if, what if a meteor hit the earth? What, what if something profoundly changed or a rule that we assume to be true suddenly was not? That's called abductive thinking. So we've talked about the four major ways of learning, right? Deductive thinking, inductive thinking, thinking like a scientist, abductive thinking, thinking like an artist or, or an English major, and Bayesian reasoning, which is how an economist thinks. If we want to look at the future, if we want to really understand what the game is, we need to ha at least have an awareness that there are other ways of learning about tomorrow, about what's going on, than we learned in high school, or that, that we learned maybe in a college major. And we need to know enough about those things to talk to people around us, to make sure that we have the breadth of that skill set on our team so that we can plan for tomorrow, that we, so that we can understand not just what we know how to know, but everything that's possible to know about the situation. And there's a system that we talk about in, in my book, Rogue Waves, and it's called the Rogue Method. And it's, it's really the best practices that I've identified from doing a broad survey of research and about $15 million of, of research on a range of things when I was the global futurist at HP, uh, of how can we know the most about the future and how can we do the best to turn that future, to future in, into opportunity for us? How do we future-proof our companies? And there are really five steps. Reality testing, right? If you want make any projection about tomorrow, there's something we know. If you start off from the wrong place, you know, every time you make another projection on that, a year forward, whatever, you get accumulation error. Right? And so this is why when you think about like a rocket that's supposed to go straight up, sometimes it very rapidly almost takes a left turn you know, and flies over Miami by accident instead of to the moon uh, when, you, when you fly, when you launch uh, out of Florida, uh, when NASA launches out of Florida. My point being, you, you really want to make sure that you've got that good baseline. Otherwise, you can get what's called accumulation error. And so, so you use reality testing to do that. A lot of the techniques I just talked about. The second is observing systems. So this is the O and what I call the rogue method. And, and it's looking at what do we know about this system? How is it connected? How, do the, how, how is it wired together? And uh, if we change the inputs, if we break a, a piece of this, if some of it gets out of control, what does that mean for the outputs? Uh, what would cause the future to accelerate? What would cause it to decelerate? And what would cause it to break? The third, so that's thinking like an economist, right? The third is about generating the range of possible futures. You know, when you take a look at forecasting in your business and most businesses, you know, it looks something like this. Yeah, we did a lot of work. We thought about the future. Here's our, our, our opinion magically. It's that we will do 6% better next year. Why? Because that's what our investors want us to do. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but uh, that's not actually how results work at the end of the year. Um, uh, that, that's just not how the future works. You, you can walk into 2020, have a great strategy, you know, two companies, uh, um, AMC, the, the movie theater company, they walked into 2020. Good strategy team. Uh, they had to make some nips and tucks, but they thought they were going to have a pretty good year. Same thing with Zoom. Zoom did 26 times growth. AMC uh, almost went bankrupt, took on a billion dollars, and their CEO said, hey, <laughs> we might still go bankrupt. Um, my point here is that uh, the world can be radically different than we think it's going to be. And if we understand that range of possible futures, then we can plan for it and we can start to, to do the next step, which is what I call uncoupling threats from opportunities. So the U and the rogue method. So how do you uh, nip, if you think about like a decision tree, right? So you start off at point A and you end up at point B and there are this range of multiple futures. What are the key choice points, you know, that would move you from one future to another? And then ask yourself, okay, how do I nip off the branches that go to their truly bad place? And then how do I maximize the possibility of uh, moving toward a much better situation? And most of the time you can do this through things like contracting, right? So how do you time, how do you sequence, uh, how do you hedge risk?
Uh, or you can do it through a series of smaller nudges. And we talk about what those are in the book too, that allow you to shift, even though the, the situation may go crazy, uh, shift the probabilities to your favor. And this is why the people who have mastered this, uh, you know, a lot of investors have figured out how to do this. And it's why there was a 13% increase in billionaires uh, in 2020, when the economy shrank three and a half percent in the United States, right? They understood how to nudge, even though the situation may have been really challenging, they understood how to nudge it to their, uh, their advantage. And then the last piece is about uh, experimenting. So, so many of us, so many of us, so many companies, they say, hey, we're in their bus this business. We do, we do this thing and we're really innovative. You know, I think uh, the, a company like General Motors is a really, really great example of this. You know, you can say they're maybe not the best car company, but I can tell you when you take a look at, at their R&D investments over the last 100 years, uh, they're an exceptional company in terms of how much they've put into innovation. The challenge is that they've made a better car, better car, better car, better car. And then a couple of years ago, they made an electric vehicle that goes 150,000 miles without a tune-up. Right? They trialed their way into potential extinction because their entire business model is based on selling cars to dealers who survive by maintaining those cars for three years and then selling the same customer another car. Well, if they sell the car and they don't have to see that customer or touch the car for a decade, that blows up the entire business model. You know, what they should have been thinking about was how do you experiment in portfolios, much like you do uh, uh, in the stock market, where you look at a range of, of uh, investments. You know, you have some, some high risk high opportunity investments, right? We're going to go into Bitcoin. We're going to go into NFTs, whatever it is. Like it's an incalculable risk. We're going to have a whole range of, you know, medium risk, medium payoff payment uh, investments. You know, we're going to go and, and we're going to invest across the stark stock market and then that EFT and an ex, uh, exchange, ex, ETF, exchange trade fund. Uh, or you know, or an index fund or whatever. And then we're going to make some insurance investments, right? We're going to make some investments that are counter cyclical or that will hold up no matter what happens. So, so traditionally these things have been like investment in real estate and REITs. Uh, they've been things like investment in municipal bonds, you know, like things where, you know, there are, these things are only going to go bad uh, if the world goes bad. Uh, or counter cyclical investments, things that, that, you know, if the world goes bad, they do really, really well. So there's a, an investment fund that's uh, advised, I believe, by uh, Nassim Taleb, the author of The Black Swan. And they did about 5,300% growth in the first quarter of, uh, of, 20, of, of, of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, you can design your portfolio of risk to take advantage no matter what the situation is. But you've got to think about it as a portfolio and manage that risk. The same thing goes for in innovation investments, right? You want to do some investments that just decrease your risk. Uh, they're, they're insurance investments. You, you can do medium level investments. You know, we're going to maintain our product portfolio, so on and so forth. And then you want to have, you know, these, these knock it out of the park investments. So a good example of this is uh, perhaps Yahoo, right? The company that, that just failed in, in an epic way. Um, but they made a seed investment or an early stage investment in Alibaba, the major Chinese uh, version of, of Amazon, uh, which turned out to be worth more than the entire company. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> And so you can do these things, but it's about managing the range of risk so that you have no matter which experiment is successful or which experiment fails, you know, you get the right payoffs on the right timeline. Interesting. So, so you did a great job there of, of explaining experimentation through portfolios. Let's dive a little deeper on the organization of your forces, because I think that's one that some can get confused about. So can you explain that one a little more for us, Jonathan, and give us some practical advice and how we can do that better? So the organization of the forces, could you clarify a little bit? Yeah, so, so right, so the O 
in your whole philosophy is right. to organize your forces, right? Test what would cause it to change. So where do we, how do we do that without mm -hmm. blowing the whole thing up, right? Is that still back in the portfolio that we're gonna test that or is that? That's, yeah, this is great. This is great. So, so yeah, it's really about observing the system, right? Like, how do you how do you build a model of 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 a system so that you can so that you can start to test it? Uh, there are a range of ways to do this. Um, every field has a has a different flavor, and in biology, they call it causal loop diagrams, and and um, uh, you know, in economics, they, they often call it stock flow analysis. Um, in computer science, it's node link uh, analysis. Um, but every every field has some flavor of this thing where you build kind of a spaghetti diagram where you have uh, where you have nodes like these these things that 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 we know like in a supply chain, right? We know that we've got this warehouse, we've got this warehouse, we've got this warehouse, right? Each of them is called an echelon, right? Where we, where you move things from China to, you know, your your local 7-Eleven. Uh, so what happens in those nodes can be really important, you know, but you can often kind of black box them and say, okay, well, we know what the input is, we know what the output is, but, you know, we don't really need to know, you know, aside from the fact that there's a box of, straws you know in in the in this in this node in this echelon right what's going on in there we know that it'll, that it'll leave it'll leave on tuesday and then how right. do these link together right so so that you have you know that no matter what happened and and you know think of them as like you know train lines that go between these nodes uh how do you know um you know the it, let me take a step back. So, so think about what's going on in supply chains right now, right? We we created a situation where our echelons were all screwy. All of the stuff came from China. It goes to lot the, to the port of Los Angeles. Um, the problem is that there's not enough stuff coming from China. There's not enough shipping to the port of Los Angeles. The port of Los Angeles is backed up, and so everything else, you know, gets janky down the stream. Well, what would happen if we did something like? manufactured in Mexico and Portugal as well. What would happen if uh, we had an addition, even though it's really expensive, of, you know, air flights uh, that, that could go to these places, right? These are very typical things that you do in supply chains, right? Um, uh, to make, to, to, to shorten those cycles and, and to backfill, you know, so, so that you have stability in your system. What would happen if, uh, we had uh, more decentralized nodes across uh, across the country. So so often, you know, you'll see one fulfillment center that covers an entire region. You know, what would happen if we did something more like Amazon, or we used Amazon and we just put three boxes of straws in every Amazon warehouse, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, you can radically change your risk profile what would happen if we changed the buffers right we had some extra straws here so that we could ship them out um yeah maybe it might be less efficient but you know if no one else can sell straws and you've got straws um that's a good business to be in right yeah so, that's so still a force gump model right with uh we, we have the only ship left in the sea right e exactly exactly um you know it's it's i i like to think about it you know, there's this thing called blue ocean strategy, which is this idea that, um, you know, you, you move into adjacent fields and, and you figure out how to use your technology, use your skills to dominate those fields and no one knows you're coming. And so you win. The only problem with this is that tends to be really capital intensive. That tends to work really well uh, when the market is going up. Uh, when the market is going down, that tends to cause a whole lot of problems. Many of the companies that uh, are profiled in the book Blue Ocean Strategy, which is maybe the best-selling business book of all time, certainly business strategy book of all time, um, they tend—they all had really bad years in 2008, 2009, and most of them had bad years uh, in COVID. Uh, their their key uh, their their key example, a company called Cirque du Soleil, went bankrupt actually. So, so that's not really a good strategy if you believe that the world is becoming more volatile. The good strategy is to figure out how to lean into that volatility, how to take advantage of it, and, and win no matter what happens. Because at the end of the day, the game of business isn't about winning this quarter. It's about winning for more quarters.
Mm, there we go. So, okay. So I want to win more quarters, right? How do I, you know, I, I'm a leader of a business. So let's say, let's say I'm, a, you know, not maybe not the CEO, but some C-level executive here. Mm. How, you know, do I, uh, do I try to pick these five up, these or these four up, right? The the different types of logic that you talked about today. Yeah. Or do I hire great people around me or do I do both? What, what Where should I go? I think it's a combination of both. I think that we're, uh, we tend to be, uh, especially in dividend performance driven companies, right? They, they tend to really be bad at that abductive thinking of thinking like an English major, right? Because it's all about how do we hit the quarter? The only problem of course, is that you, you only hit the quarter. Uh, you only deliver rely you know, above average total shareholder return. If you do things that your competitors aren't. So you have to have that abductive thinking. It's it's this catch twenty two we build into, you know, often larger organizations. Um, if you are an entrepreneur, right, you probably really, 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 really suck, you know, at logical thinking. If you understood how to think logically, there's no way on earth you would be an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so we've got to figure out where are our weaknesses. We've got to hear the people we hire around us, you know, uh, who have those as strengths. I think about I turned around a, a consultancy a number of years ago and, you know, a really visionary group, you know, really just great abducted thinking, you know, but absolutely no ability to to think it you know, deductively, absolutely none. I brought in a COO, you know, he just, it was amazing, like watching him, you know, because that's not my strength either, you know, and he just take these clumps of stupid out of our operating processes, right? They, they were there for no really good reason. Uh, and, you know, they, he saved us money, he increased our agility, and he decreased our risk all at the same time. Just because he had a different competency than I did, uh, and and that the the previous uh, leaders did, and so it's really about like learning to make sure that you have people with these range of competencies on your team, and that you're listening to them, that you have the skills to um, to both speak their pigeon, right, to speak their patois, uh, and to hear them. So an example, uh, a colleague of mine was. Uh, head of HR at, uh, or uh, she, she was, what was her role? It was broader than that. She was head of HR and communications and stuff at, at this major uh, research and development lab. She's an English major. She's been saying for years, we've got to change the way we do these things, these onboarding, training things. And, and, you know, as we bring people in, as we recruit people, because we're getting people who don't stay uh, or we're getting suboptimal people or they're taking too long to onboard. He's, she's been saying this to the leader, to the president for years. Not didn't hear it. You know, he didn't hear it. She read my book. She's like, oh, crap. He has a PhD in artificial intelligence. He's he's a Bayesian thinker, right? That's because that's how a lot of artificial intelligence works. I can draw a chart of how all of this works. You know, it's kind of a spaghetti diagram on a whiteboard, and I get to talk him through it. Well, three hours later, she has the carte blanche to do everything she needs to do to change the organization. Why? Not because she's a great Bayesian thinker. It's just because she understood the pigeon. She understood the patois. And she was able to suddenly think in here in this other language. Changed the entire company. You don't need to be a master at all of these things to master them. Hmm. So how do we do that, though, Jonathan? How do we understand the pigeon, right? How do we get the patois? I mean, is that is that really just as simple as just paying attention? Or is there some other kind of, you know, some other work that we can do to be better? Well, the, the the obvious and easy pitch is to read my book, <laughs> but but specifically chapter three, uh, where we in chapter four, where we talk about these things. But the the I, I think the the first thing is just to be aware that these things exist and ask you know if you've got a lawyer who works for you or a really deductive person, say hey, 
you know, clearly, like, you had some training in formal logic, right? You have uncommon common sense. Tell me about that. Like, uh, or, uh, or, or tell me what are the consistent things that I do that are, are illogical to you, right? Like, what are those unspockian moments uh, that, that you have with me? Right. Or if you have someone who's 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 a really good modeler, right, who does Bayesian stuff really, really well, you know, ask them, like, how do you make these leaps of of imagination? Right. To me, it's mystical to you. It's obvious. Clearly, like you sat down for a number of months or years and did some basic training on this. Um, what's the top level so that I can hear you better? And where are the pieces that I consistently miss? What's the what's just the repeated stupid, right? That comes out of my mouth. Uh, and if you just start there, all of a sudden this entirely new world opens up. At least it did for me. And then there's you know you can go deeper and you can do the the heavy reading and the serious reading and and that stuff exists. But the first thing, you know, is just to be aware that this exists, right? When you think about your education, right? K through 12, right? The first 13 years of school. If you think about an MBA, right? All they're doing is teaching this stuff, but they forget to tell you why. They forget to tell you that foundation. The second that you have these nuggets, right? All of a sudden it's like everything you've ever learned clicks into focus, right? Like I, I was, you know, looking at algebra, right? Well, what's algebra really? It's, it's, it's a method of, of logic right? Uh, I was looking at statistics. What's statistics really? It's, you know, a method of inductive reasoning. Uh, you, you take a look at, um, you know, like I said, English, right? It's, it's a method of abductive thinking, you know, reading Sherlock Holmes. That's all he does, right? You, you, you take a look, if you take a, remove all of the red herrings and stuff, because, you know, they're mystery stories. You know, what does he do? He, he starts off doing deductive work. Well, what do we know happened? He looks at abductive work. He says, he interviews people. He says, okay, well, what other information is here that that might be probabilistic? You know, he he does some kind of a network. He looks at all of the stuff and says, how does it all work together? And then he says, okay, well, obviously a hundred pe other people have looked at this and they haven't gotten an answer. So clearly something we know to be true is wrong or some piece of information still has to come to light. What What would that be? My point is that this is all around us if we know how to look for it. And the second you start looking for it, it shows up literally in every conversation, every book, every, every moment on the radio. Because these are the four things that they're all we do as thinkers in our lives. Wow. But we don't know the basic foundation. No one's, for the most part, ever mentioned it. Yeah. They've given us frameworks, but haven't colored in any of the boxes for us. So we don't know that it's really there. I think that's that's so interesting, man. I love the analogy, though, to be more like Sherlock Holmes in your work and in your research, to think like that and then go through that, Jonathan. That's super, super helpful. I mean, that's a that's a archetype, if you will, that's, that is an example that I can get behind, right? I, mm -hmm. I can see that. I can hear that, you know, even, you know, even if you're not... Ha, don't have an MBA, right? That's a practical, tactile thing we can do to be more like Holmes. That's that's really cool, man. I dig that. And so, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, you know, getting an MBA, and and I, I went through my executive training in my, in my forties, uh, as opposed to twenty five or whenever people do that. And because I'd done all of this other work, right? Because I'd done, all, I'd spent my entire life learning multiple skills. You know, it was an amazing experience because I had all the parts to put the rocket ship together. I just didn't have the manual. The challenge, I think, so much of the time is we we get super tactical. We try and move faster and so on and so forth. And we get obsessed with silver bullets, right? And, and, and that silver bullet, right, these silver bullet solutions, whether we're going to do agile or design thinking or whatever, they're useful but they're way more useful if we know how the gun works, right? <laughs> Otherwise we're just firing the gun and hoping we hit the target. 
Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, folks should definitely get a copy of your book. I mean, to your to your analogy there, right? It is a manual to help put that rocket ship together. It helps give us a lot of different ways of thinking. I love how you stressed in chapter three and four that we can help understand the pigeon if we focus on those couple chapters. Your rogue method is fantastic, right? Of reality testing, organize your forces, generate those possible futures, uncouple your risks, and experiment through portfolios. But if I was to leave one takeaway for folks, it's make sure that you understand the pigeon. Most important make, thing. If you missed that, go back and listen to that. Go ahead, Jonathan. Last yeah, thoughts. Make, make, make sure you, you understand why people are what saying what they're saying. What's going on behind that? And, and understand it enough, you know, the, the, their formal background, their, 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 we talked about epistemology before, you know, their background so that they can play to the game. Right. So, so they, so you understand the game that they're playing. Um, the, you know, you, you were talking about my book a moment ago and I, I think uh, someone recently said something that I, I wish I had come up with this, you know, it's an encyclopedia of frameworks for disruption, you know, and I think that's exactly what it is. And in our disruptive time, I think that's exactly what we need. Awesome. An encyclopedia of frameworks for disruption. Rogue Waves is the book. Friends, if you're listening, if you're watching, go get a copy. Get to know Jonathan Brill, B-R-I-L-L. Again, the book is Rogue Waves. It's a manual to help put your rocket ship together or that encyclopedia of frameworks for disruption. You can find him at jonathanbrill.com and all over the internet. Jonathan, thanks so much for sharing so much insight and so much action today. I so appreciate you. Thank you, man. Thanks, Phil.